So uh, these are the criteria that people have always used in research in the modern era. And the, the history of it is interesting in the sense that uh, sometime in the, the um, mid-70s, people began to realize that Alzheimer's disease was not a, uh, a rare disorder. And um, in fact, around that time and around 1980, epidemiological studies started to be done that uh, convinced everybody that it was so common. So this is quite an old slide. Um, I love to show it because it represents the first major epidemiological study done in the United States on the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, and it was done in East Boston, Massachusetts, and I was involved with it. And um, what we came up with were estimates of the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease that sort of shocked everybody. And um, it is true that people have come up with different prevalence rates. And so depending upon the study, you might quote different numbers. Um, the lowest, what, but, but the general finding is what's revealed on this slide, which is that among people 65 to 74, the prevalence is quite low. 75 to 84, it goes up geometrically. And 85 and over, it goes up dramatically. In this study, if you can see these numbers here, what we found was that almost 50% of people over the age of 85 had Alzheimer's disease. That's one in two people. The lowest estimate from all studies that have been done is one in four, 25%. So it's a big difference in number, but it's still a very large number of people. And everybody has found this dramatic relationship to age. And of course, the reason everybody started to worry about this when they began to see, understand the prevalence is that we have an aging population. This is just one of many, many graphs that you would find that show the increasing number of people living to older ages. And the age range that is expanding the greatest, as I'm sure you're all aware, are people over the age of 85. And if over the age of 85, one in two or one in four people have Alzheimer's disease, we have a terrible problem on our hands. And so that's why there was this explosion of research in this area, because it began to be clear how important it was and, and, and what a, a difficult problem we were going to be facing. So in the mid-70s and early 80s, a lot of work was done looking at, um, looking to see if there were certain chemicals in the brain that were decreased in patients who died of Alzheimer's disease. And the first major finding was that there was one particular chemical called acetylcholine that was selectively decreased in people who died when, and you looked at their brain tissue afterwards. And that was very encouraging to people because they thought perhaps you could treat Alzheimer's disease the way we treat Parkinson's disease. In Parkinson's disease, as you probably know, there's a particular transmitter, dopamine, that's decreased. We give drugs that increase levels of dopamine and the symptoms are really quite dramatically alleviated for quite a long time. So the hypothesis was that perhaps we could do that in Alzheimer's disease. And that was called the cholinergic hypothesis for the, after acetylcholine. And in fact, um, drugs were developed that increased levels of acetylcholine in the brain and I'm sure you're all familiar with them. So the first one that was developed is actually not on this slide, um, so I, because it's not used anymore. Uh, but the ones that are still being used are these four drugs, and three of them act by increasing acetylcholine in the brain. This fourth one acts by a different mechanism. But once they started to be used, people realized that they were not the magic bullet. And I'm sure you have many patients who are taking these drugs and you see that they continue to be quite impaired and it doesn't make a big difference in how they function. On average, the data show that a, patients will be about six months better with this drug than without it. Uh, there are some instances where, they, where dramatic improvements occur, but those are quite rare. The, the data are really just about a six months improvement with this drug, with these drugs. So that brought everybody back to the drawing board 
to say, well, you know, we followed this hypothesis, we developed these drugs, but they don't really seem to be the answer. We must be not on the right track. If brain cells continue to die and the disease continues to progress, we need to learn more about the basic biology of the disease. And that's what happened in the late 80s and early 90s. So people went back to those plaques and tangles that Dr. Alzheimer had first described um, and tried to understand more about their biology. And the first thing that became clear was that the major component of the plaques was a substance called amyloid or beta amyloid, or sometimes referred to as, to as A beta. And the major component of the tangles was tau, or phosphorylated tau. And um, for a long time, people debated as to which of these substances was likely to be the initiator, because the notion was that there had to be something that built up in the brain that caused, ultimately, the destruction of nerve cells. And there was a big debate for quite a long time um, until people began to look at genetics of Alzheimer's disease. So um, you may know, you may never have s known such families, but you may know of the fact that there are families that have large numbers of patients of Alzheimer's disease in every generation. Um, and they tend to be quite young. These uh, families develop Alzheimer's disease when people are in their 30s and 40s and 50s. They're um, fortunately very, very rare, but extraordinarily striking when you come on them. And in the, in the early 90s, late 80s, uh, scientists began to gather these families to see if they could learn more about the biology of the disease, even though this was a rare circumstance. And this gives you a picture um, of uh, the type of family that was found. So these black diamonds represent people with Alzheimer's disease. And you can see um, that there are many, many individuals with the disease in this generation. So, and if you look here very carefully, I think you can see this is, these are the ages of the people and these are the ages at which they develop the disease. So you can see how extraordinary this is, 43, 30, 45. So what scientists did was to gather DNA from people in these families who had the disease and people who didn't and try to see if they could determine genetic differences between the people who were related, some of whom had Alzheimer's disease and some of whom didn't. And what was learned was that there were three genetic mutations that caused the disease. And they were on chromosome 21, chromosome 14, and chromosome 1. There are actually many, many mutations on each of these chromosomes, all of which cause Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they also learned about a risk gene, which I'll refer to later on, APOE, but the major finding had to do with these, what we call dominant mutations. These are genetic mutations that if you have them, you will get the disease. Right. So then what was possible at that moment in time was to use all sorts of molecular studies animals with these genes put in them, cell cultures with the genes put in them, these mutations, to try to figure out what they were doing, what, what, how they were altering the biology of the brain to cause the disease. And the major finding was that there were alterations in this substance called amyloid that I mentioned that was in the plaques, this what we call A-beta-42. That was increased in the people who had the disease as opposed to the people who didn't. So that's led to where we are more or less today, which is that the dominant thought that people are working on is what we call the amyloid hypothesis. And the way that it, the hypothesis works is pretty simple, which is that for reasons that we don't understand, uh, amyloid begins to accumulate in the brain. This is in average people. 
Um, when enough amyloid accumulates, that accelerates, that clumps together to form the plaques, and then that accelerates the production of the tangles, which then form. And when there are enough plaques and tangles, eventually that starts to kill nerve cells. And when the nerve cells are killed, then we start to have symptoms. So that's the working hypothesis. And what that means is that right now, um, all around the world, pharmaceutical companies are trying to develop drugs with this hypothesis in mind. So the vast majority of the drugs that are being developed now are aimed at altering the way in which amyloid accumulates in the brain. There are some drugs that are aimed at the accumulation of tau. There are some drugs that are aimed at things like inflammation in the brain. But the overwhelming effort right now is to develop drugs that work on amyloid. And I think everybody feels that um, they ought to take their best shot at doing this to see whether or not it makes sense. If they make their best effort at testing amyloid drugs, and they don't work, then they'll put their more effort into other avenues. And of course, there are still some people that are working on other avenues. But without a doubt, the major effort is in these drugs that work on the accumulation of amyloid. And there are basically two classes of drugs, drugs that try to alter the way in which um, amyloid accumulates, or drugs that try to break it down and clear it out of the brain once it's been accumulated. And you've maybe...